I'm Steve Mann and this is Paper Classroom. Welcome to another one of our Fibers Unit tutorials. In this particular tutorial, we're going to be talking about chemical differences between different types of fiber. But before we look at the differences, we need to look at what are the actual components of any fiber. There are five components. <clears throat> There's the cellulose, that's the material that we actually want, that's the thing that physically gives us the piece of paper that we're aiming for. There's hemicellulose. As you might guess, it's a little like cellulose. The main difference is cellulose is a very long molecule that's completely insoluble. Hemicellulose is a very small molecule that's completely soluble. Lignin. Lignin is the glue that holds all the fibres together in the tree trunk, for example, or in the in the stalk of, of straw. Um, to me, lignin is a bit like a hot melt adhesive. When you heat it up, it goes all pasty and gooey and when you close it, when you cool it down, then it becomes all very, very hard and brittle. Lignin is also very hydrophobic. Whereas cellulose is hydrophilic, it loves water. Lignin is hydrophobic, it repels water. <clears throat> then we have extractives. This is the biggest group of chemicals. Cellulose, there's only one cellulose. Hemicellulose does a few. Uh, lignins are a very large, complex molecule. But extractives, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of tiny little molecules that we call extractives. They're the things that give colour and order to uh, wood. And finally, there's ash. Ash is obviously what gets left over when you burn something. So we'll talk about where that comes from as we go through each one of these materials. So this is cellulose. If you remember from an earlier video, the plant takes in water and carbon dioxide. It produces glucose molecules. And then another part of the plant strings all the glucose molecules together. If it strings them all together, in exactly the same form, it forms starch. If it flips every other molecule, as you see here, then we have cellulose. And the important thing about the cellulose is all these hydroxyl groups, and we've highlighted some of the hydroxyl groups there. It's the hydroxyl groups that form the hydrogen bonds that makes one fibre stick to another fibre. Now, paper makers can't make hydroxyl groups. Nature makes hydroxyl groups. And what the paper maker does is make them available and get them close enough together so the hydroxyl groups on one fibre can see the hydroxyl groups on another fibre and then you can get hydrogen bonding. If they're too far apart, hydrogen bonding won't occur. They've got to be really close. <coughs> Now, whereas cellulose was just one molecule, glucose, repeated many hundreds or thousands of times, hemicelluloses are quite small molecules of other sugars. So not necessarily glucose, but other sugars. And here are a selection of other types of sugar molecules. If we have uh, six members in a ring, five carbons and an oxygen, we call that type of sugar a hexose. And if you see things like this, where we've got only five atoms in a ring, then we call those pentoses. So whereas cellulose is just one sugar, repeated, 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 hemicelluloses usually consist of two or three sugars joined together. And they're quite small molecules. And because they're small, they are completely soluble and that's what we want there's a good good reason for that if you look at these hemicelluloses 
just like cellulose, they're also full of hydroxyl groups. And that's what we want. Because if you've got two fibre surfaces with hydroxyl groups coming from them, and the hydroxyl groups are just that little bit too far apart to be able to see each other and form hydrogen bonds, then these hemicelluloses can get in between and bridge between those two different hydroxyl groups so that you can form a bond. So you'll have the fiber, a hydrogen bond to one of the OH groups on one of these, and then you'll have another OH group forming another hydrogen bond with the other fiber. So the great thing about hemicellulose is, is they can significantly improve the strength of the final sheet. And if you remember back to our uh, video on pulping, the sulfite process totally destroys all these hemicelluloses, which is why it only makes weak paper. The sulfate process leaves all these things intact, so they're there to produce the hydrogen bonds to give us a strong piece of paper. Then we've got lignin. Lignin, as you can see there, is an unbelievably complex molecule. It's said that there's no two pieces of lignin on the planet that have exactly the same chemical constitution. But this is a hydrophobic material. If you want to make a, a package that's um, very strong and very stiff, then you want to leave the lignin in. The lignin will give you the stiffness. If you want something nice and flexible and flat, like writing paper, then you need to get the lignin out. <clears throat> then we have extractives. And as I mentioned a moment or two ago, there are hundreds or thousands of these molecules within trees. One of the things they do is provide the colour to a tree. So if you chop down different trees and you look at the wood, you'll see they're all slightly different colours. One extreme, you've got the redwoods, and then you've got the fairly white birches and beeches. You've got light oak and dark oak. The colour is because of these different extractives. They also provide the smell to a tree. Every tree has its own unique smell. And of course, most of you will be aware that uh, one particular tree smell is very, very popular, and that's pine. You get pine disinfectants, you get pine air fresheners. So these molecules provide smell and or odor, and they provide color. They also provide other things. They also provide a sort of antiseptic effect to a tree. Some of like tea tree oil. So some of these molecules, when they're produced in the tree, migrate outwards towards the bark. And their purpose is that if any fungal spores land on the surface of the tree, on the bark, then these things will kill off that fungal spore so that you don't get fungi growing on trees. When a tree is dying or dead, then these molecules are no longer produced, and so fungus is able to grow on the surface of the trees. If you notice, every one of these molecules contains this same group, and it's called the carboxyl group. C double OH is a carboxyl group. It's an organic acid, and it's this that's responsible for the charge on a fiber. Now, in slightly acid conditions, this hydrogen is encouraged to stay attached to the C double OH, and therefore the fiber has very little charge. But in alkaline conditions above pH seven, then this hydrogen is expected to do what we call dissociation. So it leaves that molecule and it floats off as a H plus. That leaves behind this C double O minus. So the surface of the fibers will be covered 
with carboxyl groups or with a minus charge. And that's why fibres have a negative charge. If we want to attach things to the fibres, then the obvious thing to do is to make something with a positive charge. And then the positive charge material will be attracted to the negative charge fibre. And the classic example of this is cationic starch. Normal starch has absolutely no interest, no affinity for cellulose. But as soon as you chemically modify that starch to give it a positive charge, it will be attracted to these negative fibre surfaces. And again, we'll, uh, we'll do that in a bit more detail in a, in a future video, so don't worry about it for now. And the final thing, of course, is ash. Not uh, of no real relevance to the paper maker, it, it's just there. So all the time the tree is growing, it's sucking up nutrients out of the ground. It's sucking up phosphates and chlorides, sodium salts, potassium salts. And when you burn the wood, then these chemicals get burned as well. And the sodium salts get oxidized and they turn into things like sodium hydroxide potassium or sodium oxide because it's so hot and then when it gets moist the sodium oxide dissolves in the water becomes sodium hydroxide there will be potassium salts they will form potassium oxide at the intense temperatures of a fire and then when it takes in the moisture from the air it will become potassium hydroxide a very very alkaline material very high ph ph 13 14 and it was because of this sort of thing that soap was invented so many thousands of years ago so when the cavemen were around they were making fires and cooking meat and the animal fat dropped off the piece of meat that they were cooking landed on the sodium and potassium oxides in the ash and the chemical reaction occurred which formed what we uh, and what we call a soap so a soap is a special type of molecule where it's got an ion at one end like sodium or potassium and then a long chain organic molecule which would be the fat from the animal and then of course when the in the following morning when they were clearing up the ashes they found all this sticky stuff on the hands they washed the hands in water and found they became cleaner than ever and so soap was invented and then they found obviously commercial ways of doing it industrial uh, size things so the soap or most of the soap we have today is very little different from this original soap it's a long chain molecule married to a sodium or potassium ion the only difference with today's modern soaps is you put a bit of colouring in to match your bathroom, you put a bit of smelly stuff in so it smells nice, they put a bit of moisturiser in some things because you know normal soap is about pH 12, 14. It's very harsh on taking the greases out of your hands. So let's move on. This table here lists you know generally hardwoods, softwoods, and we specifically mention cotton and straw. So you can see here the proportions of cellulose in each of these fibres. Very little difference between hardwood and softwood, just under 50%, 45% in the case of hardwood, 43 on average in softwoods. Cotton has an incredibly high level of cellulose, up to 96%. And cotton is the most durable of all the fibers and again i've mentioned before those are two words that you should learn to associate because there's always a question on the level two certificate somewhere uh, they'll either say you know tell me a durable fiber which is cotton or they'll say why do they use cotton and the answer is because it's durable and then we've got straw there a little less uh, cellulose 31 to 40 percent if we look at the hemicelluloses 
28, more in hardwood, 34%. So this is one reason why people like putting hardwoods in a, a paper making furnish. Not only do the short fibres give good formation, it has a fairly high content of hemicellulose, which will help to improve fibre fibre bonding. Softwood has a bit less, 28%. Cotton, virtually nothing. And straw, quite high amounts of hemicellulose, of, uh, hemicellulose almost 50%. So this is the reason why, this is the driver why people would love to use straw because the hemicellulose content is so high but there are some problems with straw and I'll tell you about that just on the on the final slide on the next slide and then finally we come to lignin so as I said lignin is like a hot melt adhesive as it warms up it becomes softer and softer uh, and as it cools down it becomes harder and incredibly brittle and it's very very water repellent hardwoods contain only about 21 percent lignin softwoods contain a lot more 29 percent and this is one of the reasons why we only use softwoods for mechanical pulping because what you need to do with mechanical pulping is heat up the wood and get the lignin to soften so that you can rip the fibers out and there's less lignin to become soft so it's harder to do mechanical pulping with hardwoods so typically we only do it with softwoods cotton almost no almost no lignin at all and straw you know quite high levels of lignin 15 to 28 percent almost as much as a softwood so a final word about straw before we finish Everyone would love to use it because it's quite short and good for formation. They would love to use it because of the very high hemicellulose content. But there are two huge problems with straw. One is it's a very abrasive material because it contains lots of silicon dioxide, SiO2. It's like it makes a sheet of paper like almost like sandpaper. If you're cutting sheets where straw is used as part of the furnish a slitter knife rather than lasting for several weeks could go blunt in less than an hour even as little as I've seen knives go blunt in as little as 30 minutes because of the abrasivity of the silicon dioxide because of the high level of straw in the furnish and the final thing is that SiO2 silica is very water retentive. It doesn't want to let go of its water. And so it makes the sheet difficult to drain on the machine and difficult to dry in the dry section. So you need to remember, there's often a question about straw. The problem with straw is silicon dioxide and the silicon dioxide causes two problems, the abrasivity and the water retentiveness. It doesn't want to let go of water. And as we all know, if you want to make paper, you've got to get rid of the water. Well, thank you for watching this uh, paper classroom video. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, please feel free to comment and I look forward to seeing you in another video.